right, let's begin. 75 in your hymnals, the sweet by and by. Page 75. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 75. There's a lamb that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see.
tap it? No. The lights were out? Yep. No. Do you notice how dark I was this morning? We thought, I shouldn't tell you this, but it used to be that that track, if I took the flag and bumped it, <laughs> tell you, if something happens to me, you all are going to not know what to do. I know all these little secrets and tweaks. <laughs> But if you had bumped that track, it would come on. But it wasn't that I needed the light up here. I just am so used to that all these years. It was throwing me off. So that's my excuse. If you have any problems with anything, that's my excuse. The lighting was bad. You've got a bulletin. Ushers, you come. Happy Father's Day. Hope you had a great day. I did. I had a... <coughs> Push to the minute, but it's always fun. <laughs> How many of you have a father still living? You're going to lose him someday, so you better make sure that you're as close to him as you could be. Right? your father still living? That's debatable, isn't it? Good to see Randy at the dinner. Good to see some of these guys that don't get to see a lot. And Lisa's dad was there, seemed to have a good time. And I said, how's it going? Jeremy and Lisa living there. He just said, pray for me. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, we enjoy having them. And I said, I understand. I know. Right? Ready? How many of you have something on your heart? I got a list of stuff here. If you have someone or something on your heart you're praying for. How many of you have ever prayed? How many of you keep praying? How many of you know that God can answer prayer? If you know God can answer prayer, even though he's never answered one of yours, you should still pray. Because you never know when he will. And that's why he wants us to pray. He doesn't owe you anything. Right? You owe him, so that's why you to talk to him. Ready? Pray with me. Our Father, we know that the right that you've given us to come to you in prayer it's a privilege. It's a right. It's, we're children. You called it boldness. You said we can come boldly. We don't have to pay. We don't have to say magic words. We have access right to you anytime about anything. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of coming to you. Thank you that we can ask you and talk to you and meet with you and I plead tonight for healing in those that are trying to get well and I'll name them Lord you know it's John Sheets we pray that he will have your healing the shingles the the his chest the new valve the work they've done the strength in his left hand just give him everything lord back and more so he could be strong and well for ann shuck for the healing that can happen there lord especially quickly because of your power and encourage mark help them to see you in all of this i pray for jean morris as she gets well and gets strong and walks Lord I pray that her pain will finally be gone I pray for Pat Patterson the pain that she's had and now they fixed it and I pray that she'll heal up and just be able to do as much as she chooses to do I pray Lord for Joanne Strout that she would heal up that Lord those things yet that she sees that she needs, that you would either take care of that or guide her to the right places for uh, 
the repair of those things. I think of Roger Pavey and ask you, Lord, to uh, make him well, give share and strength. And Lord, others that are just trying to move on and, and get over things. I think of Marvin Thacker with cancer and he's moving on and sharing law. I thank you for the testimony of these that have had that cancer and now, Lord, they want to get back to normal. And I think of Rich Annis. Lord, give them the strength and uh, help them to see it's from you and they ought to just turn around like those lepers that got healed and one turned around and went back and praised you and fell down and thanked you, God. Show them that you love them. And, uh, you're so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for saving us and what you do. Just give strength and healing uh, to these, Lord, we pray. Uh, I ask you to bless our night. Help our ears to hear, Lord. Help us to be alert and awake. Help us to listen to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Isn't that great? Yeah, that was wonderful. Did you ever lose your furnace in the middle of winter? Cold out, your furnace quit. You ever had that happen? Always nice to have heat in the middle of winter, isn't it? If you don't have a fireplace, I mean, we've turned our oven on. In the middle of summer, it's hot, dreadful hot, and your air goes out. It's always nice to have air when it's real hot, right? You know, when your furnace, I'm going somewhere with this, so just stay with me. You know, when your furnace goes out in the middle of winter, it doesn't matter. Follow me now, because this is deep. I ought to be teaching this in seminary. When your furnace goes out in the middle of winter and you have no heat, it doesn't matter if your roof doesn't leak. That deep? See, some of you, that went right over your head, didn't it? When your furnace breaks in the middle of winter, does it matter if your roof doesn't leak? No. You want your furnace fixed, right? That's what life is. There are some things, really, it's good if your roof doesn't leak. But if it's not raining, it's not a big problem. But when it's cold out and your furnace doesn't work, it's nice to have heat so the pipes don't freeze, right? There's a lot to that. So you can't go around pointing at stuff that isn't broken. And you can't talk about things that don't matter. What I'm saying is, what I'm about to show you, this is not about impressing you. This is not about you thinking I'm talking to somebody else. This is about fixing a problem. Romans chapter 7. This is about fixing a problem. Romans chapter 7. Now here's the deal. Nothing that I say is worth repeating. Some of it I think is. So if you think you've heard something before, there are some things I think, and all through my ministry I've done that, but I think sometimes there are some things worth repeating. And tonight I want to talk about something that I think is worth repeating. It's one of those ones I think should be, I don't know if it's just me or if that seems just a touch on the chilly side. Right, Pat? I'm going to borrow Pat's mink stole. the furnace guy to say man you have beautiful furniture may I sit on it and admire it man your air conditioning works fine it's the middle of winter man fix my furnace I want heat I don't want him asking me if the roof leaks I want him to fix my heat now look at me you got to be careful when you're going through life and something needs to be repaired that you don't ignore it or avoid it and say, yeah, but my roof doesn't leak. The basement doesn't flood. I've got new windows. It doesn't matter how good your windows are if your furnace isn't working. Well, this ought to be taught in seminary. I'm going to suggest this. We need to get get to the business of fixing the problem. We kind of skirt around it. We, so we do this in church. We say, I hear this all the time, heard this week. I, I, they tell me where they go to church. You know what they say? Uh, uh, I, I know our music's a little upbeat, but if you got to go to a church where you got to say, but something's wrong. And we need to get down to finding our problem, fixing the problem, 
and not looking at something that doesn't need to be fixed and dwelling on the fact that, hey, a roof's fine, my furniture's nice, I got new windows, my garage door opener works. You say, Pastor, that's just silly. That, that just, that's nonsensical. It sure is, and that's the way we're living the Christian life. We need to put some sense to it, and we need to look at it. When something's broken, it needs to be fixed. Romans chapter 7. One verse. One verse. Say, you are in a one-verse mood, aren't you? You have been all day. Romans chapter 7. Let, let, me, let me give you the title to throw you off. It's possible not to sin. Follow me. Let me get deeply theological. <coughs> We've talked about the hypostatic union before. What the hypostatic union means is that it was not possible for Jesus to sin. It was not possible because of the union of his divine nature with what he took on as human nature. We have a human nature and then take on divine nature. Paul teaches us in Romans 7 that it isn't with us not possible to sin, but it is possible not to sin. Do you understand the difference? I want to help you with that as much as I can, but I want you to see that it's possible not to sin. Now, if you think it's not possible not to sin, that's because you're believing the devil. But I want to show you something. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Before you read it, I want to pray, because I'm going to get going here. And then I'm going to remember at the end or the middle, some of you are going to get all thrown off, and I'll interrupt your nap. You'll start putting your shoes on. they will mess you all up. So let me pray, and then we'll just get going and go all the way to the end. And yes, I want, if you've got a piece of paper, I want you to scratch some things down. If you've got any margin in your Bible, I want you to scratch some things down. Ready? Pray with me. Our Father, I ask you for help. I ask you for your power. Lord, I, I, I feel like I need this. I don't feel like I should just deliver this to somebody else. I feel like I need this. So speak to me. Use this scripture. Use the, the uh, power of what you're saying in this scripture to help me, to teach me, to fix me, to repair me. And if you want to help someone else, of course, I ask that. I ask that every woman and every man and, and a young man or a young woman, if they could be challenged, if they could be helped today, if they could be uh, shown what's available, if they could see it, that it's there for them, and not start bragging about other stuff, or I don't do this, or I don't do that, but there's something maybe in their life that needs to be fixed. Fix it tonight, Lord. Help us to see it. Help us to own it. We don't do very well at owning it. Dear Lord, please help me. Holy Spirit, I die to self, and I want to be empty of what I want to do or what I think I can do. And I want you to fill me up that I can communicate this in a way that will be helpful to me and helpful to others. And anybody watching now or anybody that will watch, I want this to be a help to them. I don't want them to say, I, I don't believe that. That's not, 
That, that's crazy. No, Lord, according to your word, you've given us this problem. We know the reality. We know the reality. The reality is, as Paul said, when I want to do the right thing, I don't. Speak to us, please, Lord. Change our lives. Change our walk. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 18. You've already read it, haven't you? I haven't even started. And some of you crooks and robbers have already read it. <coughs> don't, don't, I'm already in. Got to read it? My pace. Ready? He says, For I know. You know, you have to know what you are. You have to know what your problem is. You have to know where you're weak. You have to know where you fell. You have to know what you really are. Nothing worse than a person that you know is not what they ought to be, but they try to convince you that they are something else. So Paul writes, for I know. Notice he says that in me, not what I do, but in me. In other words, look up, from out of me. It isn't anyone else. It isn't someone else. It isn't the influence of others, he said, I know perfectly well that there's something in me that tackles me. And he says there, for I know that in me, he says, that is in my flesh. You have flesh? You're going to have it. Listen to me. That's why you have to die. So you leave your flesh behind. That's why the Bible says if you don't die in your rapture, it says in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it says we shall be changed. That's what we need. We need a change. So in death, you leave the flesh behind and your spirit goes to heaven. And when you get to heaven after you die, you don't sin anymore. Praise God. And when you're raptured, that's how I'm going. When you're raptured, you leave the old flesh behind and your spirit is called up to be with God and you don't sin anymore. But Paul said, for now, I know that in me, that is, verse 18, look at this, that is in my flesh, in me, deep down, out, it comes out of me, not something I swallowed, it's something I was born with. It's there. And he makes it sound, when he adds to that, dwelleth no good thing. Dwelleth no good thing. You should be familiar. I don't like fancy terms. I want to be as simple as I can. But there's, there's a term we use in regards to what he's saying there. And the term is total depravity. We are totally depraved. Meaning there's nothing in us, about us, Nothing that's any good. We have total depravity or we are totally depraved. If you die 
without Christ coming in you, the fact that you are totally depraved, the fact that no good thing is in you, that means God can't let you into heaven. Because if he lets you into heaven with no good thing in you or with your total depravity, you will spoil, you'll ruin heaven. Correct? Amen. Your wife makes a beautiful meal. You've got a trash can in your kitchen, maybe. We do. In that trash can is a bag. We throw our trash in there. You never know what's in there. Sometimes I don't even like closing it up and tying it and taking it out. I mean, everything goes in there. Something spilled, something rotten from the refrigerator. We don't bury it out back six foot under. Throw it in a trash can. Let the guy with the big smelly truck take care of it. <laughs> Your wife cooks you a great meal. She throws it in the trash can. That meal, that food that she's made for you now has become totally depraved. There's nothing good about it because of what it's touched. Paul said, I know that in me, he said, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If you get to heaven without Christ, you will, you will deprave heaven. So there's no way so God said, here's what I, I'll do. If you don't have Christ, you're going to be buried in hell. Right? Lost people don't go to heaven. God doesn't go, you know, I don't want to be a mean. I don't want people to think I'm mean. God's given every, the Bible, Romans 1 says, every man's without excuse. If you don't get saved, it's you. It's not God. God isn't a mean God. God's a loving God. He didn't have to send his son, but he did. Man, he gives a lot of us more chances than we deserve. Amen. Paul said, this is Paul. This is some guy off the street. Paul did more for God than any person in the scriptures. Paul got the gospel to more places than anybody else in the scriptures. Paul wrote more Bible than anybody else in the scriptures. Right? Paul said, I know, verse 18, that in me, that is in my flesh, flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now watch this phrase. For to will is present with me. That's one thought. You have the ending of the first thought with a colon. You have his thought ending with a semicolon. This is very important. This is not one thought. This is several thoughts. He's making a point. He said, look, there is something about me that's absolutely first thought, he says, everything about me is absolutely no good. Got it? He said, I know. That is, he said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And then he says this, to will. Mm. Different thought. He said, for to will is present with me. Meaning, it's available. Meaning, it's near. That present there is the same word when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. It comes from the root of paraclete. It comes from the root. He uses it there, Paul does. He said, for to will is present with me. Not to will to do wrong, but to will to do good. So he says, there's nothing good about me, there's no good about me, but I can, I can do what I'm supposed to do. Look at the middle, verse 18. For to will is present with me, semicolon, new thought. 
He says in the end of that verse, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Say, what's all that mean? Here's what that means. That means if Paul struggled with it, you're going to. Do you believe Paul was a godly man? Doesn't sound like it according to that verse. Didn't Paul just tw twell us? Didn't Paul just twell us? Didn't Paul just tell us that in him there was no good thing? Do you think Paul did anything good in his life? Not according to him. There was nothing that he did good in his flesh. Everything that he did when he said, for to will is present with me. He said, that's, that's the can. I can't because I'm no good. But he said, I can because God has come to live in me. And we know it. He doesn't say that verse. But we know that it's there because he's taught us that. He should. He's the one that wrote to the Corinthians and said, don't you know that your body is the temple of God and you're not your own, you're bought with a prize? He said, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But according to Paul, he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He knew he was bad. Follow me. I, I'm going to kind of run through some of this. He knew he was bad. Look at me. I was talking to a preacher yesterday. I said, you know the worst thing, the hardest thing for a preacher to do? He said, what? I said, admit that he's no good. I find, look, you know the biggest sin of preachers? There's a lot of preachers that have gotten drunk. There's a lot of preachers that have been immoral. There are a lot of preachers that have stolen money from the church. But you know the one that's hurting them the most that you don't get kicked out for, but you ought to? The same one that Lucifer got kicked out of heaven for. Being proud. I saw three preachers yesterday. I said, I pray for you every day. You know, they said to me, thank you. I said, you missed something. They said, what did I miss? You forgot to say I pray for you. They said, oh, well, brother. I said, oh, well, brother what? I need to pray. Amen. Prayer, I'm not humble, but prayer helps me be humble. When I pray for others, I realize that God doesn't have to use me, doesn't have to listen to me, and you and I have to realize that we are, we are no good, we're bad. And even if we want to do right, we will struggle, and Paul's saying that, we'll struggle to accomplish good things. And we need to pray for each other, not just preachers, but we need to pray for each other and say, hey, you know what? We, we are in this struggle. He says, note this phrase, to will is present, verse 18. For to will is present. That means it's possible. That means it's in my power. Now, you don't usually get this, and you've failed so much that you don't think God can help you to do that. Let me, let me give you a revelation. It's easy to do this. Let, let, let me give you an easy one. Before I was saved, I drank. I drank hard. When I drank, it wasn't to be social. I drank to feel good. So I drank Bacardi rum. You could run a rocket with Bacardi rum. So I would buy a bottle, drink a bottle of bottle, so I feel good. I have not had Bacardi rum. I have a couple beers this afternoon, but I have not had <laughs> I have not had alcohol. 
since I've been saved. Praise God. Amen. But I drank it before I got saved. I used to smoke. I was a dope that smoked dope. I haven't smoked dope since God gave me hope. Praise God. That doesn't make up for everything else that I've had. No. Furnace is broken, my roof doesn't leak. Your furnace isn't working. Boy, it's a good thing your windows don't leak. Got good wind. What's that have to do with it? We've got to fix what's broken. Paul said to will is present. It's possible. It's in Paul is saying for him and to us that to will is present with me. He said, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. But you and I know he looked for it. You and I know that he achieved it far better than we did. So all Paul's saying there is, look, I am the crummiest of the crummy. When Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners, you and I know that we often do better at sin than he did. But he was willing to admit what he was so he could get the help that he needed. He realized that there was nothing good about him. There was nothing in him, in his flesh, that would accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish. He knew that anything that God would accept, that God wanted, that would bring honor and glory to God, had to be because of that will. He said, to will is present. Present meaning it's, it's right there. I can grab it. We struggle. We struggle when we know the right thing to say. We struggle when we know the right thing to do. But you and I, without you admitting it, you and I have had those times when we knew the right thing to say, but we didn't say it. You and I know that we've been in those times when we knew the right thing to do, but we didn't do it. And it doesn't mean that we never do it. It doesn't mean we can't do it. We just didn't will. We didn't see the possibility. And so as we go through the Christian life, I hear Wesley, Wesley asked me once, he said, do you believe it's possible to be sinless? I said, I do it all the time, but I do it a second at a time. He said, I'm serious. I said, I'm serious too. I said, watch, I'm going out of sin. There you go. He goes, I mean to be never sin. I said, that will happen when I go to heaven. He said, you don't believe that you can live a sinless life on earth. I said, here's why I don't, because Paul didn't. And if you're trying to tell me you can, then you ought to be right in Scripture. Yeah. <laughs> now look, I do not believe you can be sinless on earth. But I do believe you can sin less. Amen. Hey, if it's broken, fix it. Don't work on something else. Don't deny it. Jonah knew the right thing to do. I believe Jonah had done the right thing before. But he went his own way. Have you ever been in a situation where you knew God was asking you to do something, but you did something else instead? Paul is saying there, to will, for the will is present right there. It's right there. Sometimes we're so stubborn. The Bible calls stubbornness witchcraft. God hates it. He didn't just say get over it. He said it's like worshiping an idol. See, we need to see that. We don't see that. We just go, well, I'm Italian. Or I'm Polish. Just a stubborn Pollock. 
And Jesus overrules. Listen to these words. Jesus overrules and he overrides my flesh. If I see that it's available. Did you ever look for something and try to find it? You couldn't find it. You know what? There you ask your wife and she reaches right in front of your face <laughs> and grabs it. And then you say, where did that come from? That's the dumbest question. It was right in front of your face. Sometimes we miss it when it's right in front of us. We get a hold of something, we can't let it go even though we know it's wrong. A couple of key statements here. I don't think it hurt. I'm going to write them down. A couple of key statements. I, it wouldn't hurt you to write them down. We make a mess. Here's a statement. We make a mess of our Christian life. If you're not glorifying God, if you're not doing, wait, just put your pen on hold now. If we're not honoring God and giving glory to God and making him look good and, and we're disobedient, and it doesn't have to be a big area, it's just a little area. If you're not doing what God wants you to do, you're making a mess of your Christian life. If you make a mess of your Christian life, as a Christian, now listen to what I'm saying. If you make a mess of your Christian life as a Christian, it's not because you're evil. When Jesus saved you, remember, he doesn't call you a sinner anymore. He calls you a saint. If you were evil, he wouldn't call you a saint. But because the Holy Spirit now occupies you, God himself occupies you, if you make a mess out of your Christian life, it's not because you're evil. It's because you're frail. And you have to realize that you're weak. We say that all the time. I'm so weak. Oh, preacher, I'm so. I, in a moment, I hear this. Oh, preacher, it, why, why you quit drinking? Why are you drinking it? Oh, I had a moment of weakness. Man, you had a struggle with that. Your eyes and here you violated that. You look at something, you show. Oh, preacher, I had a moment of weakness. Let me ask you a question. Did the Holy Spirit pop in and out? He's always there, isn't he? To will, listen, to will is present with me. <coughs> I smoked. <coughs> Not a lot, but it was cool. Now that I got saved, I smoked a cigarette. I've smoked some since then, but on accident. And people puffing around you, it's hard not to suck it in. <laughs> you know, go in the gas station, pay, come out, and he goes, you smoke while you're in there? I was only in there 20 seconds, but everybody else puff, 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 puff. Even when they touch you, you smell like it. The strength that I need to overcome my frailness now is it because I don't smoke? I need strength, the will, the will that I need to overcome my weaknesses. My weaknesses anymore are not booze, are not drugs, are not cigarettes. That, that, that is gone, thank God. Amen. Some people struggle with that, man, I get it. God gave me victory in those areas. If he hasn't given you those victories, he can. Amen. We, we make a mess of our Christian life, not because we're evil, but because we're frail. He's the one that wrote. Paul's the one that wrote in the chapter prior to this. Romans chapter 6, he said, For he that is dead is freed from sin. We're not evil. We're frail. We need power beyond ourselves to win the fight that we're in. And one of the greatest gifts that we receive can be at the same time, watch me, listen to me, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us can be a curse to us, and that's our free will. I, I would hate to be a teenager today. If I was a teenager today, I want to 
Elsie G. Morris, her sister was there. Her sister married the guy whose gas station we broke into when I was 12. I said, you're Gene's sister. She said, yeah, remember me? You broke in my husband's gas station. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, there was no videotape. And if they had video now, I would be living in Venezuela or somewhere. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can, l l listen to me. Free will. I want you to write this down. Free will can make you better or it can destroy you. Free will can make you what you ought to be. You can will with God's help because of the Spirit of God. You can will to do the right thing. You know why you read your Bible? Because you will to do that. You know why you pray? Because you will to do that. You know why you witness some people? Because you will to do that. So when you don't sin, you will not to sin. So if you don't allow your free will to take you the right way, it will destroy you. And look, I'm not mocking, but we got to be careful. I say, hey, what happened? You know, you did this. You know that's wrong. What happened? They'll go, Pastor, I, I just, I was weak. Well, if you know where your weakness is, you better do whatever you can to get strong. Because if I was God and you cheated on me, I'd kill you. But God allows us a free will. A free will that can make us better or can destroy us. This will blow your mind. Tell me when you're ready. Is God all powerful? Amen. Can God do miracles? Amen. Did he create the world? Amen. Did you ever create a world? Did you ever try? You know, you can override what he wants in your life. If you will, if you will not to do his 
God. And here's why God is God. Because he lets you be your own God if you choose to. But he knows that he's a better God than you are. Amen. That's why we ought to submit. The Bible says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Why would those two phrases be put together? Because the devil resisted God. So God said, submit to me and resist him. Don't do what he did. God, write this down. God will not fight with us. Your, uh, here's the only way I could say it. God will not fight with you. If you will to do what you want to do, you'll win. <laughs> I mean, you'll win that battle. You won't win the war. Anybody in here ever said, did you ever do anything you knew you shouldn't do? Go like this. And you got away with it, didn't, didn't you? Did you, you ever do it twice? Anybody ever do the same thing twice? Ouch! God will not fight with you. He'll not wrestle you into submission. What you choose, you get. He says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Meaning they chose that. You either submit to God or you follow your own will. That's what Paul, Paul is talking there about the struggle, verse 18. But how to perform that, how to make that happen, how to accomplish that which is good, I find Nah, that doesn't mean it wasn't there. It means you didn't choose it. You and I need a power. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit's power. We need that power that will help us lay down our right to override God. Look at me, look at me. Should I, especially as a preacher, should I pray? Can I choose not to pray? Yeah. If I don't pray, I win. Now, I'm saying that loosely. God is not going to... You know what I think some people need? And don't take this wrong. I'm just speaking from the heart. Some of us just need a good kick. But God won't kick you. He'll say, if you love me. What's the greatest commandment? To love God with our heart, soul, mind, and our strength. And your neighbor as yourself. And God doesn't, God doesn't want you to have to love him. God wants you to choose that. So we have to let go of our will. Or we'll do things that we don't want to do. And we'll not do what we're supposed to do. So we have to give our will to him. We've been given the spirit of God. God himself in order to to perform, if you will, verse 18, the will of God. You can, you can override God, but if you're filled with his spirit, you won't want to follow your will. Couple of thoughts, write this down. God already paid for us. You know why people go to hell? I'm going to be theological, but you won't think it is. You know why people go to hell? Because Jesus paid for their sins, but they refused to let him pay. They go to hell. If you don't come to God and go, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe you paid for my sins. I'm trusting you to take me to heaven. If they don't call on God, then God says, you've refused my payment. Go to hell. God paid for us. Your will, as a Christian, your will is not for sale. Paul said, I'm not my own. 
I can't do what I want. I'm not my own. Jesus bought you. He spilled and shed his blood and paid a price that you or I or the whole world could never pay. If you sell out to something else, it cheapens what he's done. Stay with me. Stay with me. You know how you become free from sin? You become free from sin when you understand that your will is not for sale to anyone or anything else. Look at me. I'm very concerned about something. There's more people getting, and I don't mean people, I mean girls. There's more girls getting pregnant than ever before. You know why? Because they're selling their will. Is it possible for a young teenage girl not to get pregnant? I think one of the things that's hurting our young girls is that we're not telling them this. You know what we're saying? They all do it. The schools are saying, well, let's help them do it safely. That is super idiotic. That is anti-scripture. If they've kicked the Bible out of school and kicked God out of school and kicked prayer out of school, then when we get up and rant and rave and say that, they go, you are out of touch. And when they tell me that, I say, no, you are. You just don't see it. I'm in touch. I know exactly what God wants. You free yourself from sin when you understand that your will is not for sale. If you think your will is for sale, you'll wrestle the rest of your life. When you see something you shouldn't, your will is not for sale to that which you're looking at that you shouldn't be looking at. When you think something you shouldn't think, your, your will is not for sale. It ought to be this easy. If somebody starts saying something that you shouldn't listen to, you shouldn't smile and say, I don't want to be impolite. You should say, you know what, I don't want to hear that. Because your will is not for sale. If two young people are in a car alone, and they shouldn't be, two young people are in a car alone, and something goes the way it shouldn't, one of them ought to say, hey, my will is not for sale. That's the biblical description of a harlot. She puts a sign on her body and says, for sale. Well, our young girl and our, our young man with a mind looking at that junk ought to be saying, hey, I am not for sale. Here's, here's the meat of the matter. We are children of God. That's it. I belong to God. Hello? Amen. You look awake. We are children of God. Amen. I'm not of this world. The Holy Spirit is my strength. So I lay down, I give up my right to override God. When God says, I want you to read the Bible, I don't pray about that. I read my Bible. I don't say, look, if I say, well, I'm tired, I didn't have time, I'm overriding God's will. And the more I do that, the worse I'll get. Now, I'm sorry, but this needs to be said. Don't come to me and moan and groan and complain if you're overriding God's will in your life. I can't fix that. Amen. If I was out there, I'd be amen. I cannot fix the fact that you choose to override God. So you better get your act together. You better start saying, I am a Christian. I am God's child. That's it. He wants to read his Bible. That's what I do. He wants me to pray. That's what I do. Not because it's something you have to do. It's something because of who you are. We are children of God. 
I'm not a child of the devil. If I live like the devil and override God, then I look like I belong to the devil. But I'm not. It's possible for me. It's possible for you not to sin. As long as you say, God, I'm yours. Every day, you just submit all day. If you got to do this all day, you got to write on a card, you got to mumble it all day, you just mumble it, you tell yourself, I belong to God. I, I, I heard yesterday more preachers falling into sin. Why? Because they're overriding God's will with their own will. I'm not mine. I, I don't belong to me anymore. I, I have laid down my right to override God. And I have thrown out the window the strength of my flesh. Because I know I'm weak. Hey, I want to be like Paul. I know, he said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. If you knew there was something in you that could destroy you, would you not take precaution to stop it? Paul says, let me tell you, for to will is present with me. What I need, the power I need, is with me. The power, it's present, it's at hand, it's grabbable. We don't grab it. Question, did Adam and Eve have to sin? No. No way. Did they sin? Yes. Why? Because they used their will to override God. You keep doing that, you're going to be a mess. You're going to be a mess. You, you need to guard. You, you, if you say this back to me, you're preaching the choir. I don't, I don't. I mean, it's rough. Everywhere you go, you, you can't, you can't. The devil is out to get us. He doesn't try to trip us up and go, whoops, that wasn't really meant for you. Everything he's trying to trip you up is meant. It shouldn't be a problem, but it is. Here's the problem. We don't admit we have a problem. How you doing? I'm, I'm good. Are you really? How's everything going? Good, good. You know why? We don't want anybody on our back. If I said to you, hey, how you doing? Man, I'm just having a problem. Lying. You think I'm going to go, oh, well, God bless you. So you know what we've, we've done? We override. We say, I'm, no, I'm good. Everything going good? Yeah. That's why if I talk to you, I go, really? You say, I don't like when you do that. I know. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Boy, I'm having a struggle with gambling. Man, I'm a gambler. You think I'm going to go, hey, I, I got a problem. Or do you think I'm going to say, you what? Meet me in my office. So what do we do? I'm good. How's everything? Good? You okay? Yep. How's everything go? I, our biggest problem is that we don't think we have a problem. Where's our power? Our power isn't in our flesh. powers in him. But if you keep overriding, if you keep being God in your life, and I'm talking to me too, I'm, it's just the you, where you go, you should listen to these. I have to prepare these. I don't sit down after and watch them because I hate them. I hate every one of them. God whips me up and down before this. 
Thank God I listened to it. Thank God God's working on me. And, and then I, I think, God, I can't preach that. I'm struggling with that. He said, yeah, well, other people are too. Give it to them. But I know when I give it to them that I'm wrestling with it too. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. No moving around, don't look around, don't mess around. Don't zip up and just hold still. Don't be a distraction. God may speak to someone and you might cause them to be distracted enough that, that they'll lose their concentration. I want you to concentrate. Hold still, sit still, listen to what I'm saying. God has spoken to you tonight. You know it's him. You're kind of sweaty. You're kind of riled and ruffled. Why don't you just take it to him? Why don't you just walk the aisle and say, God, I'm not quite sure exactly what's going on, but something's going on. Show me what it is. Show me how to deal with it. Show me what to do. God has all the answers. His word has all the answers. Just admit that you need the answers. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. You say, preacher, God is speaking to me. There's something that I need to take care of in my life. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Here's my hand, preacher. God is speaking to my heart, up and down, up and down. God is speaking to my heart, heads bowed, eyes closed. Preacher, God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me. It, I, I don't want to be bad. I don't want to be uh, uh, in a struggle. But I know that there's too many times I override what God wants. There are people sitting home tonight, hope they're watching this, that could have shown up but didn't. I hope they're sitting in their chair or table, wherever they're at. I hope they're going, man, that's right, man. You override God once, it gets easier to override him the second time. Don't do it. Don't do it. Last call. Preacher, would you pray for me? I haven't raised my hand. Preacher, God's speaking to me. God's speaking to me. Up and down. Up and down. Dear Father, this is just an issue of being broke. We're broken spiritually, and we need to let you fix us. We think, oh, I'm okay, this isn't that bad, that it, but we, we miss that thing that's not allowing us to be victorious. I want, I want, Lord, I want, for me, I want victory. You work tonight. You bring people down the aisle. You deal with them. Spirit of God, you deal with them. That's what you want. I ask it in Christ's name. Pianos play. You're standing, your head bowed, eyes closed, unless you're coming. Unless you're coming. Come on, come on, come on. Just start making a list. Start finding those little things where you override God. You override the will of God. And start saying, one at a time, say, God, help me. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix that. I'm, I'm going to fix that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fix. God, you help. Give me the power. To will is present with me. Give me the power to perform that. Come on, you come on. She's playing you. Come on. Murder's wrong, adultery's wrong, robbing's wrong. You know what God really, really hates? When the Bible talks about the things that God hates, you know the first thing it says God hates first? Pride. Pride, a proud look. You gotta swallow it or spit it out or do whatever you gotta do with it, just get rid of it. I think. Just in case, just in case, she needs to play it through one more time. If you need time, that's why we're doing it. If you need to come and you haven't, come on, come on. You can't grow as a Christian.
Christian if you try to grow in your flesh. The only way you grow as a Christian is as you yield your will to God and allow in your spirit for Him to build you up. That's how you grow. You get frustrated, baby, because you've been trying to grow in your flesh, and that there's no good thing in that. You don't grow there. You just will over all of you to God, and you'll grow. I'm going to pray. Our Father, how wonderful it is that you have given us the power The power, we, we are enabled, the Bible says, by your power to be what you save us to be. When we got saved, we became children of God. We became new creatures. Old things are passed away. We need to keep becoming new. There ought to be a newness about our Christian life daily. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I, I'm, I need it. I need more of it. I need to do it. I need to fix those areas of my life that are broken. I need to, they used to work, or, or they're not destroyed. They're just broken. Help me. God, help me not to override your will. I, I pray this, Lord, and you know it. And I, I have been, and I want it, and I just need your help. Help me. Help me to yield to you. Help me to submit to you. Help me to know it's you. The only way I'll get to where I ought to get to, the only way I'll be what, what I ought to be is as I yield to you. Thank you, dear Father. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.